title I've given this is Process Theology in the Current Crisis. The United States spends more than any other country on research and on teaching research methods to university students. Yet the coronavirus found us unusually unprepared to respond. This is not because we have not been attacked by similar viruses in the past. It is, of course, partly because we are suspicious of the government meddling in such matters. And this kind of research does not appear to drug companies as likely to be profitable. But it is also, and I think more importantly, because universities are organized into academic disciplines, and this research does not fall into any one of these. Much of the scientific and scholarly talent of the nation is thus sequestered into narrowly defined specializations in ways that omit many matters of importance. One might hope that human and historical importance would influence instruction in universities. But once they have become congeries of academic disciplines, it does not. And of course, there is no place in the universities to discuss whether revisioning higher education might be desirable. The irrelevance of higher education and university research to important questions carries over to the livability of the planet. Occasionally, faculty in some academic discipline become disturbed by what they see happening. In the late 60s, ecologists discovered that natural systems were breaking down at a rapid rate. <clears throat> More recently, climatologists discovered that the world was heating at a frightening rate. We speak of the ecological crisis and we speak of the climate crisis. We should be extremely grateful that they have warned us. It is striking, however, that neither ecologists nor climatologists look to their colleagues in other disciplines for help. What they were showing us was a matter of extreme historical importance. The causes and consequences of breakdown are economic, political, social, religious, and educational. We might have expected that economists, political scientists, philosophers, students of religion, and teachers of teachers would immediately shift gears so as to guide the world into needed changes. If so, we were acutely disappointed. Here and there, faculty in various disciplines saw connections they could make and wrote essays about this. But these gestures had no effect upon the disciplines themselves. It is possible that the current global crisis may lead to a discussion of whether the best way to organize universities is to make their work largely irrelevant to resolving society's problems. If this is the conclusion, then we need another set of institutions designed to generate information and discussion that may help to guide us. Perhaps some youth would prefer to be educated in that context rather than trained and socialized to do research in narrow compartments of knowledge. Since corporations and military preparedness can gain from that kind of research, no doubt others will continue to pursue it. You may wonder what this has to do with theology. When theology tries to define itself as one discipline alongside others, the answer is very little. The study of creeds and confessions and great thinkers of the past will be little affected by the fact that civilization may well end in the near future. However, some of us in the process community have returned to an earlier understanding of theology. We think of it as bringing the Christian perspective to bear on important issues. 
critiquing economic theory from a Christian point of view may be more genuinely theological than learning more about the classical creeds. It is at least a more biblical approach to the theological task. From our point of view, it is sad that neither the church nor the university considers our efforts relevant to their task. Both agree that economics should be left to the economists. Theology should stick to its distinctive topics. If these can be tweaked so as to relate in some marginal way to the current situation, fine. But we should not transgress the barriers that prevent scholars in different dis diverse disciplines from influencing one another. Of course, process theologians would not have chosen the theological vocation if they did not think that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Bible and the church and faith and personal salvation are important topics. We can present our views of these matters alongside those of other theologies. But for us, the importance of God is not really appreciated if God is only related to the other topics in that list. We believe that atheism and secularism distort the academic discipline of economics to begin with by thinking that the economy can be understood in abstraction from the total lives of the people whose economy it is. To truly believe in God is to know that although God is only one of many causal influences, nothing happens apart from God. <clears throat> the refusal to acknowledge God's role distorts not only economics, but the other social and individual sciences as well. When God is ignored, so are freedom and responsibility and radical novelty. Even the hard sciences suffer when the fine tuning of the universe has to be declared a matter of chance at the cost of positing millions of universes for which there is no evidence whatsoever. Our understanding of thought in general and of the Christian's task would not have sounded strange prior to the 18th century. Until then, it was assumed that the task of theology and philosophy, not sharply distinguished, was to offer a vision of the whole that accorded with Christian experience and conviction and illuminated them. This assumption that we need an overview received its first great blow from Descartes who taught that we must drastically distinguish the human and the natural. However, this dualism was still a cosmology, although a fractured one. It was the work of Hume and Kant to end the quest for cosmological understanding. The crucial event was Hume's discovery that fundamental scientific beliefs are not grounded in empirical experience. Science might even be defined as the search for efficient causes in the natural world. But Hume found that no matter how hard he looked at billiard balls knocking each other around, he did not see any causal relation. Kant accepted this negative conclusion and reconstructed the whole of philosophy around it. If we cannot find efficient causes empirically, but nevertheless make great progress in science by discovering them, it is clear that causal relations are the way the human mind necessarily orders its empirical data. We can no longer attribute causal relations to nature. They are human ideas inescapably imposed. Kant's analysis ended cosmology since it showed that our statements about the world were only about the human construction of a world, not about the world itself. 
Descartes had never thought of human beings as part of the deterministic, materialist, clockwork world that he taught science to posit. Kant never thought that what he agreed to be the world of science could guide human beings in dealing with real issues. He thought science could learn much about human beings by studying them in this way. But he wrote a separate book about how to deal with practical issues, the critique of practical reason. It did not occur to either of them that human beings are fully part of the natural world that scientists study. Darwin administered a far greater shock to human beings than any philosopher. He showed that we have evolved in just the same way as other species. We are entirely, exhaustively part of nature. This directly opposed Descartes' dualism, but it intensified Kant's dualism. It showed that the human being about whom science teaches us is none other than the human being who must turn elsewhere to make decisions. But we must think of this one human being in two completely disconnected ways. There were two main responses to Darwin. One was that if we are part of nature, then nature is much richer than we had supposed. Descartes excluded purpose from nature. We know that we have purposes. Therefore, purposes play a role in nature. The evidence of purposive activity in monkeys, for example, can no longer be excluded a priori. Indeed, the common sense belief that many animals have emotions should be given credence. We can call those who took this view neo-naturalists. For them, evolution is a cause called to revise our thinking, not only about human beings, but also about the whole of nature. The major alternative was to retain the view of nature as exhaustively understood in objective terms and accept the implication that human beings are part of that world. Any feelings that our actions are affected by purposes is illusory. If feelings of purpose exist, they are irrelevant to understanding why we act as we do. The explanation must be purely physical. Some people still think they have feelings and purposes and have practical decisions to make. Most of the proponents of this comprehensive mechanistic view affirmed a Kantian dualism implicitly and sometimes explicitly. The latter prevailed in the university world. Kant thought pure reason was inherently reductionist and mechanist and purposeless. The actual research of universities that had brought them such prestige was based on these beliefs. Kant justified and supported continuation of this view, extending it to human beings. In Germany, the followers of Kant had developed Wissenschaften. These were communities of scholars who concentrated on research in clearly defined areas that are mutually independent of one another. The scholar could become an expert in his Wissenschaft and teach students how to do so. German research was the wonder of the world. Ambitious Americans went to Germany to get a really good education. They brought this ideal back to the United States. The German Wissenschaften became our academic disciplines. Universities constituted themselves as collections of academic disciplines. American research caught up with German research. Kant taught that pure reason deals only with facts. It does not evaluate. Practical reason deals with values, but gives them no factual status. 
Institutionally, it was assigned to the church. Since the church was having trouble defending the factuality of its teachings, this came as a relief for liberal Protestants. That is, for those who took modern critical thought seriously. Conservative Protestants and Catholics were less willing to give up the claim of factual truth. I hope this history explains fairly how we come to have an educational system that does not try to be relevant to current issues. It excludes values, which include importance from its instruction. Many professors care deeply about what is happening and want to help people, but this is an extracurricular activity. An influential book written to such faculty is entitled, Save the World on Your Own Time. It explains that university professors are paid to do and teach research in a particular value-free discipline. That the exclusion of relevance from academia is understandable and faithful to the teaching of a great philosopher does not mean that it is what the world now needs. I personally am strongly opposed. I consider that Whitehead has shown where we went wrong and how to recover from our mistakes. This will be the next topic of my essay. Whitehead locates himself in the succession of British empiricism much of the first third of process and reality is his engagement with Locke, Berkeley, Hume, and Kant. He agrees with much that they have said and finds that some of the consequences to which he objects can be corrected through their own insights. Philosophers delight in pointing out that critics like me attribute views to great thinkers that they themselves nuanced or even occasionally rejected. That is fine for a value-free philosophy not interested in relevance. No doubt neither Hume nor Kant would fully appreciate what I describe as the consequences of their views. My comments ignore all this refined discussion. My interest is in explaining how we came to have an educational system dedicated to irrelevance to the most pressing issues. If a more careful reading of human Kant does not justify the outcome, then I welcome them as allies in working for something very different. Hume's failure to find an empirical experience of causality and Kant's awakening are the most decisive grounds of the end of philosophy as cosmology. Whitehead wants to renew the cosmological enterprise, which integrates facts and values, shapes our science empirically, informs our beliefs about ourselves and our world, and gives guidance to dealing with our urgent issues based on what we learn. However, he cannot do that without an empirical basis for causality. He thinks that British empiricism was much too narrow. It limited empirical knowledge of the external world to what can be learned through the senses. And in fact, it attended only to vision. Consider how the history of philosophy might have gone if Hume had given equal attention to the world of sound. For Whitehead, phenomenology is part of the study of em empirical experience. When we listen to music, we could suppose that, empirically speaking, we hear only one chord at a time. But in fact, if that was so, we would not hear music. When we hear the final chord in a musical phrase, we would simply hear a single sound, if there were no causality. But in fact, we hear the conclusion of a phrase. The earlier chords are present, 
in the experience. They play a causal role in the hearing of the chord as completing a musical phrase. This experience of causality is fully empirical. Whitehead focuses attention on the whole of experience. In this whole, causality plays a very large role. My experience in one moment is largely reenaction of my immediately preceding experience. The immediate past experience flows into the present one, largely determining it. This is certainly an experience of causality, that is, of the past shaping the present. It is pervasive of human experience. If we are part of nature, then it is reasonable to believe that my experience is fundamentally similar, not only to that of other humans, but also to that of other animals. Since the past seems even more determinative of the present in the inanimate world, there is no reason to deny it to molecules and atoms. Whitehead proposes that fundamental to the becoming of every actual entity is the causal relation we can identify in ourselves, the pouring in of the past. When Hume was looking for causality, he was looking for something in the objective world. Science abstracts from the subject. Whitehead posits that in its act of becoming, everything is a self-constituting subject. It experiences the inflow of the past and its self-constitution out of that past. As soon as it becomes, it is an object for others. The scientist is one of those others. We know in ourselves the difference between ourselves as subjects and as objects. We know we are not fully known when we are experienced only as objects. That science has flourished by ignoring the subjectivity of its data may justify its neglect. But when scientists suggest that in fact its objects have no subjectivity, they are wrong. And this mistake sometimes leads to destructive consequences. Hume was correct that causality is difficult to find through visual experience. He was wrong to judge that the world of vision is the only world there is. The consequence of his mistake has led philosophy in the wrong direction. It is important to build on more reliable foundations. We may note as we proceed some of the consequences of the focus only on the objective. We are told that with artificial intelligence, machines can do everything we can do. I think this is not true even objectively. But the spontaneity and purposeful causality that enable humans to introduce radical novelty into the world have no existence for those who deal only with the objective side. Today, there are those who think our machines can not only replicate us, but improve on us. They really think that human beings will be superseded by them. If this belief leads to decrease in human survival, the humanism of which at an earlier time, secular modernists were so proud, goes down the drain. As a Christian, I find Whitehead's analysis of causality extremely helpful. It shows that much goes on subjectively in human beings that is not replicable in machines. It is highly congenial to biblical thinking. In the Bible, there are times when God seems to act upon the objective world objectively in the fashion Hume thought of. But far more important is God's role in the subjective world. God speaks and we hear. God calls and we respond. God loves and being loved frees us to love. God heals through our faith. God certainly plays a large causal role, but God does not control. 
The Bible, even Job, does not teach God's omnipotence. That idea arises only when we focus on the objective. Subjectively, every event is causally influenced by pa many past entities. No event comes into being in relation to only a single antecedent. The idea of omnipotence could arise only in a metaphysics of vision, the most objectifying of our sense organs. It leads to or stems from substance thinking. Hearing leads to appreciation of events and processes. It leads to historical understanding and the telling of stories. The Bible gives us process theology. Creeds and dogmas arise only in a world of vision, a world of objectivity and substances. We think it is quite wonderful that philosophy that so long bought into the world of substances and condescended to process thinking has now found that for the sake of understanding the entities of which the world is constituted, it must adjust to the primacy of events and processes. There is at least one metaphysically central role of God that is also spiritually essential for Christians. I've been writing about how God is one contributor to every actual occasion. Apart from God, there would be no basis for the act of synthesizing the many causal forces operative in each occasion. God provides to each occasion a starting point that Whitehead calls the initial aim. God aims at the increase of value in the universe. From this divine aim, each occasion derives the aim to add what it can to the cumulative value of all things. This aim, in addition to affecting the synthesizing process, also, especially in living occasions, can introduce elements not derived from the past. God is the source of novelty. The dominant university worldview does not allow for this kind of novelty just because it does not allow for God. The experiential evidence is that it does occur. I believe that through phenomenological analysis, we can discern a call forward. I wrote about that theologically and subsequently was pleased to find in Heidegger, Der Ruf nach vor. For me, it is confirmation of Whitehead's metaphysics and the Christian understanding of God's way with us. Heidegger, as an atheist, could concluded that we call ourselves forward. His kind of ex existentialism is extremely individualist and it uh, did not discourage him from supporting Nazi ideas. To me, a call feels like it comes from another. If we build our metaphysics on phenomenology without a metaphysical bias, we will include another who calls. Our spiritual exercise will include, perhaps even center on opening ourselves to God's call moment by moment. This is an important aspect of grace. God always calls us and empowers us to become the best that is possible. God wants for us what is truly best for us. That is an expression of authentic love. God plays another role important for both philosophy and theology or simply for common sense. Most of our talk is about the past, sometimes the very immediate past that provides the sense of for our present experience. But in the present moment, where is the past? We have already noted that it is part of the present moment. But of course, what is reenacted in my present experience is an infinitesimal part of the past. So we might note that other parts of the past exist in the experiences of other people and perhaps other animals as well. 
But even if we can account for the reality of a good deal of past in this way, we know that there is much, much more. Should we say that in fact, all the rest simply does not exist, is not real? If so, then of course statements about it are neither true, true nor false. Yet we discuss what happened in the past as if our statements were more or less accurate and inaccurate. Many of us Christians think it is important that Jesus really lived and taught and was crucified and that Paul had a resurrection experience that turned his life around. Many people think there is a distinction between real historical work and propaganda. But for any of this to be, the past must be in some way real. Whitehead believed that the past exists in God. In finite creatures, some is briefly preserved, but in the infinity that is God, it all exists forever. The divine experience is cumulative. Nothing is lost. God is truth. I've spoken of this as an important belief to keep us grounded in reality. But for us Christians, the assurance that God loves us is also important. Whitehead confirms that in a double sense. First, what I said earlier is that God always wants the best for us. We might call that agape. God is agape. Second, we have just been talking about God's total compassion. God feels our feelings with us in the present moment. Otherwise, our true experience would not be preserved in God. Compassion means feeling with. God is compassion. Of course, there is much more to be said about God in Christian theology. Much of what process theologians say is quite similar to what we read in the New Testament and what some other theologians say. I want to point out the way in which process theology differs from those theologies that have followed Kant. Even when we agree on the language to be used and preach a verbally identical sermon, there is a profound difference. For those who operate inside the Kantian formula, it is understood that the assertion that God loves us does not claim to say anything factual about reality. They are not affirming the actual existence of God. They accept that we do not know anything about God. God may exist or may not. They are speaking of how human beings can best organize their thinking about matters with respect to which nothing can be known in order to achieve their legitimate purposes. Process theologians agree that if knowledge requires certainty, then we know nothing about God or about one another or about the world or about ourselves. Whereas Kantians need not deny a kind of certainty about facts within pure reason, Whitehead does. What seems certain today may become questionable tomorrow. But we live with a kind of certitude about well-tested theories. The affirmations about God I have made about, above based on metaphysics are examples of such well-tested theories. When process theologians assert that God loves us, they express their confidence that there is God and that this God works for us and with us and has perfect compassion for us. They encourage others to test these beliefs. Check alternatives against the evidence. A very important test for theologians is the test of personal experience. If one lives as if the call forward is from God, and if this tends to make one more sensitive to the call forward and find that attending to it enriches life, the possibility that one is wrong does not disappear but there can still be an existential certitude. There are also the testimonies of many who trust God's love. I once, perhaps for two minutes, felt the loving presence of God in a way that was totally convincing to me. 
does not prevent intellectual doubt, but it entirely breaks out of the Kantian denial to practical reason of any affirmation of facts. Much of contemporary liberal, liberal theology derives from Kant, especially through ritual. Kant's thought, no doubt, has enabled many to remain in the Christian fold, who were convinced that they could not argue factually for the existence of God or the divinity of Christ. Liberals want to be open to the best thought of the day. For many, and for the universities as a whole, God has no role. The arguments against atheism by conservative Christians have often been naive. Liberals proudly set themselves apart and support objective scholarship. Nevertheless, the liberal churches are dying. To serve a loving God who in fact may not be loving and indeed may not exist does not seem important to young people seeking guidance about their lives. Process theology wants to communicate that the exclusion of God from the university has had disastrous consequences and that the denial of the possibility of serious conviction about what, is God, what God is doing and wanting from the church does not help. For us, it is possible to call for belief on the basis of both theoretical and practical considerations. Does that mean that individuals and traditions that do not believe there is any cosmic spirit who loves and guides are to be rejected? This would be a disastrous outcome. There are bad traditions as well as good ones, and more accurately, all traditions have positive and negative elements. The Nazism that attracted Heidegger had good elements, but at least in retrospect, the judgment of most thoughtful people is negative. I have indicated that if Heidegger had recognized the cosmic lover behind the roof knock four, he would have been better off. Those who exclude the reality and importance of the subjective would be better off if they acknowledged both. I definitely make negative judgments about much of what has happened in modern thought. On the other hand, many people have been taught an omnipotent God who is highly judgmental. They fear God. For them, the discovery that the God they fear does not exist is liberation. Some have found refuge in the humanistic secularism that seems to work well for them asking them to consider a different God from the one they have escaped is usually fruitless. But at some point, a good many have found that they can benefit from attending to the Abba of Jesus. The Chinese historically have not rejected the idea of divine beings, but they have not believed in anything that the Abrahamic traditions call God. They may have been well advised to stick with the Tao. The Abrahamic tradition need to learn from them what they find objectionable in monotheism. Central to the problem is the kind of power attributed to God in much of the monotheistic literature. Given the choice of a non-theistic spiritual world was better. However, to the distress of current rulers, many Chinese are now hungry for something they do not find in their tradition. Process theology could respond to that need without the negative consequences the current leadership rightly sees in the form of Christianity that is now spreading. The most interesting case is Buddhism. In some forms, it is seriously atheistic. Some, through meditation, come to the realization that there is in them no authentic self and find unity thereby with the absence of a divine self. In Hinduism, the human self, or Atman, was recognized through meditation to be one with the ground of all things, Brahman. The denial of God by Gautama was primarily the denial of Brahman. 
there is nothing substantial within us. There is nothing substantial in the universe. This is quite remarkably similar to the position of process thought. There is nothing substantial. There are no substances. For Gautama, that meant there is nothing to cling to. Freedom from clinging meant freedom for whatever comes. One does not impose one's norms. One has, or better is, complete compassion. One overcomes the power of the illusion of an ego. Exposed in its non-existence, the ego does not get in the way. This is a wonderful goal and has been richly meaningful to many people. However, in fact, it need not be atheist, as many suppose. Most Buddhists identify a cosmic other whose love is very meaningful to them. In Japan, Zen Buddhists are accused by pure Zen Buddhists of self-salvation. The Zen Buddhists right, rightly point out that there is no self to save one. Nevertheless, they do not seek the aid of another. Pure Land Buddhists look to Amida's grace for help. For them, faith is crucial. There are far more numerous than the followers of Zen. There is extensive commonality between Christian process theologians and those Buddhists who put their faith in Amida. We are closer to each other than to most of our fellow Christians and Buddhists. Yet there is a difference. Western process thought places a great emphasis on human history. This attentiveness to selected past events comes to us uniquely from the Hebrew scriptures and especially the prophetic tradition. History has not been directly related to spirituality in either India or China. In Christianity, Jesus was an historical figure with an historical mission. Process theologians see responsible historical action as more important than meditation, although many appreciate in practice forms of Eastern meditation. Currently, Buddhists are learning from the West. Sulak Sivarak in Thailand has played a central role in creating socially engaged Buddhism. Masao Abe, a leading Zen missionary to the West, thought Buddhists should learn social ethics from Christians. I supervised one dissertation by Pure Line Buddhist and one by Zen Buddhist. Both were on social ethics. Abe helped me with both. I do not think it is inappropriately boastful to say that just as Christian theists can learn both about theology and meditation from Buddhists, so also Buddhists can learn historical relevance from Christians. I will conclude this section on the multiplicity of beliefs and practices with a couple of generalizations. Overall, we should consider our own beliefs as partly true and partly mistaken. We should also approach others with similar expectations. Process thought discourages excessive confidence in any position, including that of process thought. It assumes that no set of beliefs could have played a large role in human history without including important truths. Today, it is fashionable in liberal circles to dismiss any idea promulgated by President Trump. But the supposition that tens of millions of Americans have been duped by ideas with no truth content at all is highly implausible. We should approach what is different, including what is distasteful, with recognition that it too is a mixture of truth and error. We should remember that for many centuries, civilized people viewed the ideas of indigenous people with contempt. It is only recently that civilized people have begun to see the negative aspects of civilization and the superior elements of wisdom in the beliefs of indigenous people. Jack Hutchison was one of the early authors of surveys of the world's wisdom traditions or religions. He organized a book around three types of wisdom, traditions, or religions. For one, 
Central is an impersonal ultimate. For another, central is a personal ultimate. And for the third, central is the world. At one point, Whitehead writes about three cosmological entities, none of which could be without the other two. They correspond with the three centers of religion identified by Hutchison. There's creativity of which any entity that is actual is an instance. It is Whitehead's dynamic replacement of the Thomistic being itself. There is God. There is the world. But there can be no creativity without God and the world. No God without creativity and the world. And no world without creativity and God. In general, the Abrahamic traditions worship God. The Indian traditions seek to recognize the identity of the individual with the universal being or non-being. And the indigenous traditions attend with sensitivity and commitment to the world that bears and still sustains us. Although traditions tend to make one of these three central, most bear some witness to the other two. Process thought overall gives equal importance to all. But as a Christian theologian, I attend especially to God, realizing that Christian process theology is one expression of a larger vision. That larger vision can serve Buddhists equally well to accent the importance of creativity and it can also be used by those who seek to renew the devotion to the earth of so many indigenous peoples. After all, one of Whitehead's definitions of religion is world loyalty. Perhaps even more important than our relation to other ancient wisdom traditions is our relation to the scientific tradition. Process theology may be the only progressive theological tradition that explicitly engages in discussions of scientific matters. Theologians influenced by Kant, of course, considered this entirely inappropriate. And most philosophical theologians accept the boundaries established by modern universities. Even those who might think it desirable rarely have the competence. I am one of the incompetent. However, Whitehead has made it clear that most scientists are still committed to Cartesian and or Kantian dualism. I think I have learned that these are both mistakes and mistakes with negative consequences. We think we understand how these mistakes were made and how they can be corrected. Regrettably, many scientists cling to one of these dualisms. One cannot entirely separate these mistakes from the ongoing work of science. Both of these dualisms support a continuation of Descartes' exclusion of purpose from consideration by science. Especially now that scientists are known to be part of nature, no convincing philosophical argument has been made that their desire to be accurate plays no role in their science or that their science plays no role in the world. This reflects the confusion caused by commitment to the metaphysical dogma that none of the objects of scientific study are influenced in their behavior by purposes. The metaphysical claim, however, is that anything we claim is an outcome of purpose can be explained by physical efficient causes. We can argue about this endlessly. Nevertheless, to me, it is evident that my conversation partners often passionate exclusion of purpose is itself purposeful. This incoherence is so evident to me is ignored. We are more interested, however, in the effects on scientific theory of this exclusion. Note that the two types of cause that Aristotle assumed to affect behavior were the efficient and the teleological purposive. When science eliminates any attention to the latter, we are left with efficient causes. If everything is explained by efficient causes, the result is that everything is determined by the past. If indeterminacy must be acknowledged, the alternative is chance. 
Science thus, in general, assumes determinism with chance allowed to play a role in special instances. This bias, bias is far from irrelevant to the effects of teaching science and the social acceptance of its authority. The exclusion of teleology also leads to the rejection or suppression of theories for which there is empirical evidence. I will take as a recent example the treatment of Lynn Margulis among evolutionary biologists. The standard teaching of evolutionary biologists is that evolution occurs by random mutation of genes and the ability of the resulting phenotypes to survive. Chance and competition are key. Lynn Margulis thought that cooperation was equally important. It is obvious that members of species cooperate in their efforts to survive. This is not denied but ignored. Elements of cooperative behavior may contribute to success in the competition to survive. Acknowledging this required no basic change in standard theory. Margulis proceeded to examine specific instances of evolutionary change. She thought that synergy explained much that happened. This is a far more direct challenge to the standard theory. Synergy, as usually understood, opens the door to consider purposive activity. She focused her attention on what I consider the single most important step in evolution the emergence of the eukaryotic cell. She showed that it came into being through the merging of cells or parts of cells, not by random genetic mutation. Her colleagues were not at all pleased by this proof of an exception to their favorite axiom. They ignored it as much as possible and treated her as an outsider to the guild. They could not deny her evidence, but they could deny her funding for further research. They did not want to find evidence of cooperation and synergy. They moved too easily toward the re-entry of purpose in biology. If biologists were open to basing their metaphysics on evidence, this would have been a wonderful opportunity rather than a threat to be continued and hidden. A negative, another negative ad, result of adherence to Descartes and Kant is the commitment to the primacy of material substances. The closest things to a material substance in physics is mass. The competitor for priority is energy. Mass and energy are typically convertible. However, there is no mass in which energy is lacking. Whereas in much of the universe, energy is present while mass is not. Also, light has no mass, but consists of energy. Therefore, that energy is more fundamental than mass is a no-brainer, since both the masses that dominate the visual world, the plasma that fills the space between the stars, can be understood in terms of energy events. A shift away from the model of material substance would benefit science in many ways. The subatomic world could also be integrated into a universe of energy events. The resistance of scientists to this move is not scientific. It is a matter of usually unexamined metaphysics. What scientific difference does it make? It makes scientists in many fields ignore plasma. Students of plasma physics believe they could throw light on dark matter and dark energy, but their offerings are largely ignored. Ignoring plasma allows them to treat the vast spaces between galaxies as a vacuum, and supposing they know the exact speed of light through those regions. The most damaging consequences of the adherence of scientists to a reductionist worldview are found in economics. Substances necessarily are mutually external to one another. The substantialism of most science depicts a world of independent individuals. 
Economists base their science on the view of such human individuals. Substances conflict with one another for spatial location. The worldview always favors co competition over cooperation. A community is simply a collection of individuals, so the destruction of communities for the sake of increasing production is not understood to involve a loss. By destroying life-giving communities, global economic development threatens the future of the planet. From the perspective of process theology, the real authority of the United States is taught in the graduate economic departments of major universities. For this theology to go unchallenged just because it does not mention God or Christ or church is an abandonment of Christian responsibility. I'm leaving Catherine Keller most of the discussion of the current plague. I have noted some reasons that we were radically unprepared to deal with it. I will conclude by calling attention to a difference between East and West that reflects their respective metaphysics. The causality not found by Hume and Kant was an objective relation typically between one cause and one effect. Not finding it empirically led to positing it as imposed necessarily by the mind. The West has sought specific cures for specific diseases. Chemists have found some remarkable cures. For the East in general, and for Whitehead, everything in the presence is the consequence of many forces from the past. In the case of someone dying from the coronavirus, the cause of death is not the virus alone, but the whole situation. People whose general health is better or much less likely to die. Often some contact, some, someone contracts the virus but is little affected. Old people are more likely to die than younger ones. The poor are more likely to die than the middle class. Not because of poverty as such, but because their diets and lifestyles are likely to be less healthful. In other words, isolating the virus and declaring it to be the killer ignores many other contributors to death. Something can be gained from finding a way to kill the virus, but as many or more lives will be saved by improving the general health of the poor. Oriental medicine does not have the dramatic effects that are sometimes achieved by chemicals, but it may save more lives. It certainly contributes more to the overall well-being. If we can greatly reduce the negative consequences of the virus by improving public health, there will be less need to close businesses and schools and to shut people up in their homes. Overall, metaphysics matters. The West has suffered from bad metaphysics and from being told that metaphysics does not matter. We believe that the best metaphysics available today is beautifully supportive of discipleship to Jesus. We hope to spread that message. Thank you. <laughs>